staying away from sin because he came to set us free from sin. He came to set the captive free. He came to reconcile us to the Father. And there's nothing wrong with talking about sin. Life is short. The days are evil. And we need... Well, we started a short series last week. I told you it would be a two-week series. And last week we talked about what Jesus did not come for. Amen. What Jesus did not come for. And we actually read verses that he said himself. Things that he said himself is what we talked about yesterday. Last week. See, it feels like yesterday. Last week. If you will please uh, stand to your feet. I want to just read the one verse before I get into the scriptures. And that verse is going to be 1 John 3, verse 8. 1 John 3, verse 8. Praise the Lord. And the word says, He who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Father, I submit to you, Lord, you do what you want to do. You speak to us. You bring us the revelation that we need in this hour to continue to walk with you. Honor and glory unto you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Today I'm going to be talking about what Jesus came to do. Okay? Last week it was what Jesus did not come for. And today is what Jesus came to do. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the living God. There's the festivities out there, but we need to understand where we stand and why we do what we do. So Jesus did have a first coming. The series title is A Close Look at Jesus' First Coming. And today we're talking about what Jesus came to do. Uh, just as a quick reminder, last week we talked about what he did not come to do. He did not come to cancel the law. He did not come to reconcile relatives, uh, bring peace between relatives. He did not come to uh, condemn the world. The world is already condemned. He did not come to be served. Amen. And so piggybacking on those things, we'll be seeing what he came to do. Uh, first of all, Jesus is the son of God. He is our example. So as the example, the way he walked on this earth is for us a teaching. Every single thing he did is actually a teaching for us to show us how to walk as a child of God. So if you are a child of God, or rather if you are a son of God, girls or boys, if you are a son of God, there's a certain way that you're supposed to be walking. And that's the way that Jesus came to show us. How do we walk as sons of God? So he came to show us that example. And he, he, let's go to John 1.18. As he came to reveal the Father, let's go to John 1.18. Uh, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. The word says that he had declared him. He didn't even say he showed him, he said he declared him. So everything that Jesus did on this earth is a declaration of who the Father is. Every time that Jesus healed someone, he declared that God is a healer. Every time that Jesus delivered someone, it was a declaration that God is a deliverer. Every time Jesus provided for some people, because you know, he multiplied bread and fish and provided. Every time God, uh, Jesus provided, he declared that Jesus, uh, God is the provider. So the walk of Jesus on this earth is a declaration of who God is, and it's also an example for us to walk as sons of God. Because a son is actually a representation of his father. So if you are really a son, it should be seen in you. If you are a son, something about you 
need to show that in fact you are this person's son. And this is what Jesus came to show us. Our life is to be a declaration of who God is. So the word of God says no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father, he has declared God. He has declared the father. So what did Jesus come to do? Jesus come to show us how to live as children of God. He came to be an example, a prototype of a son of God, how a son of God is to be walking. And a prototype of a son of God is to be declaring his father. And so as we understand why Jesus came, we need to from now on walk around knowing that our life must be a declaration of who the father is. Hallelujah. And this is why one of my prayers is always, Lord, not because of me, but for your name's sake. Mm -hmm. So you glorify yourself in my life so people can see me and glorify you. So it's not because of me, but it's because of you. It's, by your, it's, it's for your name's sake. And this is what Jesus came to do. He came to declare the Father. And so as we are celebrating... And there's a lot of festivities. Let us keep in mind that we are and our lives are a declaration of who the Father is. And so this should also lead us in some, on some paths. And there are some paths that we should not be on because there are places that we don't need to declare the Father in. Our lives need to declare the Father, not the devil. Because we are not sons and daughters of the devil. We are sons and daughters. We are actually sons of the father. And so as he came to declare who a son of God is, uh, which is a declaration of the father, so shall it be in our lives. The son of God, Jesus, came also to reconcile us with God. Now last week I read the passage where it said that he did not come to reconcile us with our relatives. Does it mean that Jesus does not want us to be at peace with our relatives? Does, does it mean that Jesus does not care about peace in our families? No, that's not what it means. But you see, one thing about our God is that our God does not address symptoms. He is not into symptoms. He is not into dealing with symptoms. You see, when you have a sickness and you go to the doctor, the doctor will deal with symptoms. You have a headache, I'll give you a painkiller. You have this, I'll give you something to manage that issue. They deal with symptoms, but God does not deal with symptoms. God deals with the root. Because he knows that once he takes care of the root, the problem will be solved. And so he does not come to reconcile us to our siblings or to our fathers and mothers and all that. No, 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 that's not what he does. Because he's, he knows that if all of us, brothers, sisters, fathers, mothers, if we have a common goal, which is Jesus, if we have a common goal, which is our, the salvation of our soul, our soul, if we focus all on the same thing, the more we focus on the same thing, the closer we will get to each other. Last time I told you that usually people who are in the same area tend to draw close to each other. If people like, you know, computers, they will tend to gravitate around people who like that same thing. If people like to party, they will tend to gravitate around those people. I mean, it's just like that. It's, it's a matter of interest. It's a matter of your, your focus, what you like. And so when people focus on Jesus, you tend to gravitate together because, you know, there is something that you can talk about. Uh, you can even see that in families. When in a family, even if there are a lot of brothers and sisters and, and, and there is a few that love the Lord, those who love the Lord are going to be closer than, you know, those who do not love the Lord. That's just how it is. So Jesus came to take care of the root of the matter. The root of the matter is the reason why you are not together 
is because you don't understand who you are in Christ. The reason why you are not together is because you don't understand the, your life purpose. The reason why you are not together is because you have not yet been transformed into the likeness of Christ. The reason why you are not together is because you don't, you, you, your heart has not been changed yet. And what's going to change your heart is if you are in Christ. If you, if you love Christ, if you've gathered together with Christ, if you, if you let Christ work in your heart, I told you before, that Judas' problem was not that he killed Jesus. That's not his problem. Judas' problem was that in spite of all the time he spent with Jesus, he didn't let Jesus transform his heart. And so if we let Jesus transform our heart, we will necessarily be closer. No one will have to reconcile us to our siblings. If our siblings seek God, and we seek God, no one will have to reconcile us to them. If our family members seek God, and we seek God, no one will have to reconcile us with them. But if while we are seeking God, some of them in the midnight hour are flying somewhere, using mirrors and padlocks and doing all kind of crazy stuff and in, in, in the forest and in waters, surely we won't get along. Mm -hmm. Because I am looking at Jesus and that thing that you do is against what Jesus said. So I'm always going to bombard you. And so we, can't, we cannot get along. You see? But if we all focus on the same thing, if you all focus on our Savior, we will all get along. So Jesus did not come to reconcile us. We said it last week. But what did he come to do? He came to reconcile us with the Father. Let's go to Romans 5 verse 10. Romans 5, verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Amen. So Jesus' purpose was to reconcile us to the Father. Why? Because there was enmity between us and the Father. There was a distance between us and the Father. And what caused the distance? It was sin. Sin that the devil brought in. So for Jesus to reconcile us to the Father, he had to take away sin. Let's go to 1 John 3, 5. He had to take away sin, 1 John 3, 5. And you know that he was manifested to do what? To take away our sins. And in him, there is no sin. So Jesus came to reconcile us to the Father. And the way he did it was by taking away our sins. And by changing our nature so that we are no longer called sinners, but we are called saints. That's the word. What else did he come to do? He came to save sinners. We said last week that, you know, he didn't come to condemn the world. That's what Jesus himself said. Why? Because the world is already by default. The world is already condemned. By default. Since Adam came. Since Adam came and, 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 and saw Eve eating that fruit. And he took the fruit and they shared it together. I just, uh, I was reminded of a joke that was going around yesterday, but it was not, the serpent did not give him the fruit. The serpent just talked. <laughs> and then the, uh, and Eve took the fruit and Adam took the fruit. Anyway, so even as they took that fruit and, and something was engraved into the DNA, let me tell you something about the spiritual world. It's very, very, very important the way we work, the way we walk, the way we talk. Why? Because for some reason, it is not, I don't know how to justify it, I don't know how to explain it, but things that we do actually get engraved into our DNAs, and that's how we transfer it down. When Adam sinned, that sin got engraved into his DNA. So every child that was born from that point on from Adam, meaning from a human being, that child is by default condemned. I even mentioned last week that as cute as a baby is, and babies are usually cute. Yes, usually. Babies are usually cute, right? But they are still by default condemned. 
And Jesus came to pull them out of that road. Jesus came to pull me from out of that road. Jesus came to pull you from that of, out of that road, that road that is broad and wide, that is leading to hell. Jesus is pulling people from that road. He did not come to condemn, but he came to save sinners. He came to save that which was lost. Let's go to 1 Timothy 1.15. 1 Timothy 1.15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. He came to save sinners of whom I am chief. Let's go to 1 John 3, 8. Now, when he came to save sinners, at the same time he came to expose the real culprit. Because if people sin, it is because Satan pushed people to sin. So the real culprit, even as Paul tells us later that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, it's always against demons. So the real author of sin is not human beings, but it's Satan. And so for Jesus to save sinners, he had to expose the devil. And even as he exposed the devil, he has to also destroy destroy the works of the devil so that sinners can be saved because it's one thing to tell someone I don't go there like you have a, a little child that is walking around the house and there's a knife laying around you're going to tell the kid don't go there don't go there don't go there but as long as you don't pick up that knife and put it away eventually that child will go and grab the knife so you don't just tell the knife, don't go there. Uh, you don't just tell the kid, don't go to the knife. But what you do is you take the knife away. So when Jesus comes and he says, don't sin, don't go that route because you are going to perdition, he had to do something about that sin. Because as long as he did not do anything about the sin, people will keep on sinning. This is exactly what happened in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, God was telling people, don't go into idolatry. Don't do this. Don't do that. Every year, they would kill animals. They would just use the blood of animals for covering their sins. But they will go back. Every time God says no idolatry, they will go back into idolatry. Every time God says no sinning, they will go back into sinning until Jesus came. So human being has proven over and over again that if you do not do something about that actual sin and the author of sin, human being will keep on falling and falling and falling and there's nothing you can do about it. So Jesus came and exposed the culprit. He exposed the devil and he destroyed the works of the devil. So reading 1 John 3, 8, the word of God says, He who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested. For what purpose? Well, that he might destroy the works of of the devil. Why does he want to destroy the works of the devil? Because as long as the works of the devil are there, human beings will always fall into it. Now, someone may say, well, how come we are still sinning? When Jesus came and destroyed the works of the devil, he also gave us his blood to cover us. So number one, you are pulled from the kingdom of darkness. Number two, the blood of Jesus covers you. So when the blood of Jesus covers you and you walk in Christ, now you are hidden in Christ. It's like you, a little child that is not walking by himself, but is now walking with an adult to the point where even if he walks by a knife and is trying to grab the knife, the adult will minimize or neutralize the effect of that knife. That's what Jesus is doing with us. He is walking with us to the point where even if we walk by something that is there to destroy us, because he's walking with us, he will neutralize the effect of that thing by pulling us away from it and by reminding us that that is not a place where we should be walking. So Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. He destroyed the works of the devil by doing deliverance. He destroyed the works of the devil by, doing, by providing for us. 
He's doing the works of the devil by taking care of us, by protecting us. He came to save sinners. He came to expose the devil. And he came to destroy the works of the devil. And one more thing we need to look at is the fact that he came to prepare his second coming. He came to prepare his second coming. He came to impose his kingdom and prepare his second coming. When you read the Old Testament, people are sinning, they're falling, they're tripping, they're getting back up and all of that, that back and forth, back and forth. And the time came and Jesus came and he shed his blood so that humanity can be saved. But God did not just save us so we can be just saved and be around and just that's it. That's not the finality. That's not the final uh, point. That's not the final goal. The final goal is for us to come back with the Lord and reign and rule on this earth. That's the final goal. The final goal is for the king of kings to come back. And just reign on this earth where the devil has been reigning for years and years, for thousands of years. Jesus wants to come back and reign as a king. But he does not want to come and reign while his people are under bondage. He had to set his people free first. And even as he set his people free, he's telling his people, occupy until I come. Because there are more people that are going to perdition. There are more people that are going to hell. So occupy till I come. Do the work. Pull more and more people out of that path. And then when the next appointed time comes, I will come. And I will now reign and rule on this earth. So the word of God is clear in Ephesians 5.27. Ephesians 5.27. That when Jesus came, he also came to wash us, to cleanse us, to straighten us, to make us presentable to himself. The word of God says that he might, that he is Christ, that he might present her, her is the bride, to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that he should be holy and without blemish. This is a passage that I like to share with people when we talk about marriage. I like to share this passage with people because a lot of times we don't understand this. The, the Ephesians 5 is a whole chapter. We need to read the whole chapter, not just one verse. The word of God said that he might present her. He is what the Bible called the bridegroom. The husbandman, the Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who is coming to present to himself a glorious church. The church being his bride. He is presenting his bride to himself. And how does a bride look? She looks without spot. She looks without wrinkle. How does that come about? Jesus does the work. Jesus does the work. He cleanses his bride. He makes the word available to wash his bride. Yes, the bride has to do her part. She does have to do her part. Jesus is not going to come and pull you physically out of certain circumstances. You need to know why you don't, you're not supposed to go. But one thing is, the work is done by the Lord. He is the initiator. He is bringing his church without spot, without wrinkle. Or any such thing. Nothing that even looks like a spot. Nothing that even looks like a wrinkle. But that, 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 that the church will be holy and without blemish. This is what Jesus does to prepare us to his second coming. So why did Jesus come on the earth? Is it so that we can look at some cute pictures of a cute little baby laying in a manger somewhere? No. Is it so that, you know, we can know of a story of some Magi's? And we are told that there were three Magi's. The Bible does not say three. There were three types of gifts that were given. It does not say three Magi's. You can read Matthew. Is it so that we can go around and, and, and just 
spend all the money we cannot, we don't have? No. It is so we understand that the one that came down here on earth was God himself. After he had done, he has given all the rules that will purify us. After he has done all the rules that will reconcile us to himself, we human beings prove to God over and over that we could not be reconciled to God on our own. We don't have the strength to be reconciled to God. We are not able to live in a way that God would want us to live on our own. So he came down here on earth. He took on human flesh. And he came. The word of God says that he was tempted in all things, yet without sin. Never did he sin. Yet he was tempted in everything. That's what the word of God said. To show us that, yes, we too can be tempted. But we don't have to fall for all those temptations. If Jesus came to show us how to live as a child of God, as a son of God, and he was tempted in all things with our sin, he is showing us that, yes, temptation will come our way, but we don't have to fall for it. We don't have to fall for temptation. He came, and the word of God says, you can see that later in the book of Isaiah, and he repeated that in the book of Luke 4. But he said that he came to set the captive free. Who is that captive? The captive is you. The captive is me. He came to set us free. So if God determined that we were captive, and he came to set us free, and the word of God says later in Galatians 5, 1, that it is for freedom that he set us free. Wouldn't we want to walk with him who sets us free? Wouldn't we want to go with him who is able to free us? As opposed to continuing to fall for what the tempters will want to fall for and walk in a life of sin? Yes, today is December 25th and everybody, we are all talking about Christmas, but I'm going to talk about staying away from sin. Because he came to set us free from sin. He came to set the captive free. He came to reconcile us to the Father. And there is nothing wrong with talking about sin. Life is short. The days are evil. And we need to walk in the path of the Lord. To prepare the second coming is what he came for. And that second coming, I read it to you earlier. He would not come to pick up for himself a bride who is soiled. He is not going to come to pick up for himself a bride who has a lot of wrinkles. He is not going to come and pick up for himself a bride who is with plenty of spots. He is not going to come to pick up a bride who says, Oh, you know what? Jesus loves me anyway. I can walk anyhow I want. He is not coming for such a bride. He is coming for a bride without spot and wrinkle. So the first coming that peop some people are celebrating because other people in the world don't even think about Jesus. But the first coming that other people are celebrating has a meaning. And we need to keep that meaning in mind. If we are able to celebrate Jesus today and every day of our lives, we need to remember why Jesus came. Jesus didn't have to come. Being God, he doesn't need me. He doesn't need you. But he came because we are on the way to perdition. He came because by default, we were all going into hell. He came because the devil was tempting us and accusing us and binding us. So he had to come expose this devil and destroy the works of the devil. That's why he came. So the coming of Jesus has to do with your freedom, with my freedom. The coming of Jesus has to do with your shackles and my shackles being broken. The coming of Jesus has to do with you and me being sons of the Most High God, declaring and decreeing who God is on this earth. And this is why your life and my life should be different. Amen. We are not to match everybody else. We are not to mingle with anything and everything. Uh, doesn't matter what people think of you. Oh, you are narrow-minded? I'd rather be narrow-minded and know where I'm going.